Restricted, an overdue conversation. Work text. Anakin skidded to a stop in the doorway of the Chancellor's office. He was breathing heavily and seeing spots, but that was nothing, it was background noise, it wasn't important. Within the public office of the Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic, a last Jedi Master battled alone, blade to blade, with a living shadow. Neither man had noticed him yet, and Anakin felt a scream building in his throat. Stop. He stopped. Master Windu stopped. The Chancellor stopped. The noise, the electricity, the wind, the fear, it all stopped. From behind him, a light feminine voice said, Star child, we need to talk. Frozen, unmoving, still as stone. It occurred to him that he ought to be panicking about that, a bit, or at least questioning it. But the last few days had already been so goddamn weird, at this point, Anakin was willing to accept just about anything. Just behind him, sitting on the empty desk of the Chancellor's head secretary, was a young woman with long red hair, green eyes, and the grace of someone trained in the art of killing. She wore a nondescript grey jumpsuit with a white vest open over top, a leather belt that held a blaster and a lightsaber, and sturdy looking boots with metal caps on the heel and toe. She was looking at him blankly, head tilted to the side, as if he were a piece of art that she would understand if she only stared long enough. He blinked at her. After a moment, she pursed her lips and frowned. No, she said, tapping her heel against the desk. I don't think this is right. This form doesn't resonate with you, does it? What? Anakin asked. There was nothing else to say. It doesn't resonate with you. She repeated, her eyes moving off to the side of his face, not even really looking at him, just staring into the middle distance. This would work for the sun, but not you. Let's try this. She snapped her fingers, and everything changed. Anakin leapt back, grasping and activating his lightsaber in one movement, but by the time he had it up in his preferred guard, she was someone else. It hadn't been quite instantaneous, and Anakin was trying hard not to remember the awkwardness of the moment between forms, but it just wouldn't go away. The pale young man with a white brow and piercing blue eyes, sat in the place the young woman had been moments before. He was dressed in brown and black, but the saber and blaster were still in place at his hips. After a second, Anakin narrowed his eyes, who are you, changeling? Who is this supposed to be? The boy the changeling blinked. Does this form not work either? You spent a good amount of time training him. Anakin had had enough, he didn't have time for this, he took two steps and leapt towards this intruder. Whoever they were it was obvious they shouldn't be here, not in the Senate, not in the office of the Chancellor, not after Master Windu had evacuated the building. His saber came down on the secretary's desk, slicing it neatly in two, and filling his nose and eyes with acrid smoke. It was not, however, the acrid smoke of burning flesh, since the boy dodged out of the way easily and was now in Anakin's blind spot. It didn't matter, this changeling was no match for him, the greatest duelist in the GD order, general of the 501 ST, the hero with no fear. He didn't feel like the hero with no fear right now, though. He didn't feel like a general, or a GD, or even a man right now. He was exhausted and disoriented and filed to the brim with panic and frustration, and this changeling saw it, and this changeling could take advantage of his weakness at any moment, and anyway, none of this was going to help save Pan. The changeling had jumped back out of range, but instead of drawing the saber, they held out their hands in supplication. I don't believe we have time for this, star child. I cannot hold us in time forever, even I have limits. Anakin came at them again, faster than any regular person could be able to track, but once again this changeling evaded his attack. Anakin was about to use the force to drag them closer, to make them stay in range, when the changeling ducked under his guard, yanked Anakin forward by his shirt, and brought them close enough to knock their foreheads together in a Celtic kiss dot. You are not well, star child. The changeling said, his tone tired and warm and concerned. I cannot explain until you can find understanding, and you cannot do so like this. The world went black, and Anakin knew no more. When Anakin woke, it took him precious seconds to remember where he was, what he was doing there, what was happening and why. This was made more difficult by the fact that he did not know where he was, or what time it was, or what had just happened. It didn't seem to matter right now, really. He was lying on something soft with a blanket thrown over him. He'd even remembered to take off his boots, which was better than usual for him. It's extraordinary what can happen when I'm not paying attention. Anakin groaned something unintelligible and rolled over, and through bleary eyes, glimpsed a tall slim woman with blonde hair in a complicated updo, with eyes like ice and a smile like a razor. For a moment all he could do was wonder when the Duchess of Mandalore had gotten here. 
He jerked upright, suddenly very aware of the wrongness of this situation. He was sprawled out on the couch in Palpatine's office, while Master Windu and the Chancellor were still frozen in place, locked in a battle of wills with the wild wind, threatening to send them both tumbling to their deaths, currently being spoken to by a dead woman. He fumbled for his saber, but the facsimile of Satine Chris rolled her eyes and shook her head. Don't bother with your weapon, Star Child, you cannot hurt me here. You cannot hurt me at all, but especially not here. And what is so special about here? He growled. The changeling smiled like Satine too, sharp and quick as a blaster bolt. Because we are in your mind. What? What? Satine turned away from the battle taking place well, not taking place, and came to sit beside him, folding her legs beneath her with the same grace that Padden had in handling a blaster. You and I need to have a conversation, and we couldn't do that with you in the state you're in. I have removed your hunger, your exhaustion, your physical pain, and any effect that this she gesture to the deep red curtains and plush Nubian furnishings of Palpatine's office, place may be having. As long as I am here with you, your mindscape will remain neutral to any and all influences that could affect you. How do you feel? Anakin blinked, took stock of himself. The exhaustion of the past few days, weeks, months, years, had faded, and his customary morning headache was mysteriously absent. The strain and ache of his muscles after the action on the invisible hand was gone too, and his breathing had eased with the erasure of the pain in his chest that had dogged him since he left Ahsoka and Rex behind with Bo Caden. The place where the actuators and nerve interface pressed into the skin of his right arm didn't even hurt. That always hurt, especially when he forgot to find time to maintain it. In truth, he'd never had time to maintain it properly, not since before Christophsis. Satine was still waiting patiently, so Anakin admitted, I feel okay. She raised an eyebrow, but didn't see the need to call him on that. Instead, she turned her head to look at Master Windu, her face smoothing into a picture of quiet contemplation. After a moment that it almost stretched into being awkward, she said, I didn't notice him at all, you know. And here he was, a picture of balance. Anakin frowned, looked between her and Windu. What do you mean you didn't notice him? He's the master of the Jedi Order. Everybody knows who he is. Everybody knows how great and strong and reasonable he is. How perfected Jedi. Great and strong and reasonable. All at the same time. He jerked his head up. He hadn't said that aloud, had he? Satine turned back to him and smiled again, kinder this time. No, but there is no real difference here. We are in your mind, star child. Thought and word and wonder and action, they are all the same here. Okay, okay. We need to back up at least five steps. Anakin said, standing and doing so. I still don't know who you are, or what is going on, or why everything in this room and frozen. For the first time, she looked puzzled. Frozen. I did not think this space was particularly cold. Anakin's brain may have stopped at that point, but he stuttered over the words anyway. What the cold? Not cold, frozen. Unmoving, standing still. Her expression cleared. Oh, I see. Apologies, it is more difficult for me, in a form like this, she gestured to her clothes and big headdress full of lilies, I must limit myself down to speech and body language to get my point across. It would be even worse in physical form, this woman cannot even touch my power. Her eyes drifted away from him again, mouth pursing. I am not even sure who she is, to be truthful. I was looking for a quality, a word, someone you knew but weren't emotionally invested in, the kind of creature that you can listen to and accept their words as truth without too much arguing. The quality about them too, it is not like resonate, but perhaps it sounds like it. Anakin listened to this rambling explanation in mounting confusion, before something kick-started his brain back to functioning. Are you you were looking for someone I respect? Respect? Satine repeated, bringing her hands together in a sharp clap. Yes. That is the quality for which I was searching. It was more difficult than I expected. She looked at him, one eyebrow raised. Who is it you do respect, star child? Stop calling me that. Anakin snapped. And I don't have to answer any questions, especially since you still haven't told me who you are. Satine stopped. Opened her mouth. Closed it again. Do you not recognize me, dear one? Anakin's fists clenched. Just because you look like Duchess Satine doesn't mean a thing when I know she's dead, and I'm done with you. I am the Force. He stopped. He blinked. He had no idea what to do in the face of that. He breathed in. He let it out. What? I am the Force. She said again, with the simplicity and conviction of the truly righteous and the truly mad. 
Anakin took another breath in, let it out. He still had no idea what to do in the face of that, so he settled for, Banta should. Satine raised an eyebrow, a smile playing around her mouth. Do they? Stop it. He snapped. This is impossible, it is impossible, this is Bantha shit, and I don't believe you. It's not really a matter of belief, star child. Prove it. She blinked. What? You hurt me. Anakin said, and then tried not to feel like a Padawan fighting with his clanmate. You can't just throw something like I am the force out there without anything to back it up. Prove it. You know, for a warrior monk, you have surprisingly little faith. You're the one claiming to be an energy field. Do you want me to listen to a word you say? Show me some carking evidence. Satine stood in one long, fluid movement. She gave him a dangerous smile. As you wish, star child. Anakin had one second to second guess this before the lights went out. He was falling. Falling and falling and falling, tumbling end over end in nauseating circles, seeking and trying and failing to find his equilibrium. He was falling through the blackness into an endless abyss, except the abyss wasn't endless, and it wasn't even black, not really. As he twisted his head, he saw stars, planets, and systems glittering all around him, a shimmering nebula of gases and elements floating in the void, spread out below him with no purpose in the galaxy, other than to exist and even stars burn out. Anakin felt the wind in his face, blowing back his hair, the sand and grit biting against his skin, trying to strip him raw and expose the soft flesh beneath, the suns beaming their light down on his head, searing their heat into every person, every machine, every animal, and every stone. There was engine grease on his hands, and the smell of burning fuel all around him, the control column was in his hands, but he was spinning out anyway, tumbling over and over and crashing into the sand. The sand was burning and tearing, and it could swallow you up, it would drag you into the riptide, drag you down and drown you at the deepest part of the dune sea and... I came back and freed all the slaves. He was running now, running with the freedom and wildness and lightness of childhood, a childhood he knew he'd never had. The halls were white and full of sunlight, the ceilings so high and full of air and shafts of color, the lines of trees that changed color, according to the mood of whoever were closest. They were changing to shimmering gold as he passed, tree after tree, leaf after leaf, and he let out a wild and delighted laugh that echoed and resonated around him until he was carried by it. The joy and laughter and light of his people, his people were soldiers, his people were slaves, his people were Jidi, carried him on and on and. He is the chosen one. He stumbled and turned it into a shoulder roll, coming up in a crouch to deflect the blaster fire. His saber hummed in his hand, his weapon, his life, his best defense against the droids and the Sith and the slavers and the burning of stars. His troopers were counting on him, his Padawan was counting on him, his master was counting on him, his government was counting on him, his wife was counting on him. He couldn't stop, he couldn't blink, he couldn't lose focus, not even for an instant, if he faltered, they would fail, if he fell, they would fall, if he died, they would all die, and he would never let that happen. He was the chosen one, he was the hero with no fear, he was the most powerful GD in the order, and he had to save them all. Your focus determines your reality. Anakin was alone and he was surrounded, he was fearless, and he was so so afraid, he loved his wife and his apprentice and his master and his men and his mother, and why did life keep trying to take them away? He was. I'm a person, and my name is Anakin. He was. You're strong and wise, Anakin, and I am very proud of you. This time, they weren't in the Chancellor's office. He opened his eyes in the training cell, the underground private one that the GD Guardians used to perfect their skill with a saber staff. Anakin sometimes wondered if they'd studied the footage of Obi-Wan fighting Darth Maul as much as he had, but he doubted it. He'd been just a little obsessed with that fight when he'd first come to the temple, and even now he should offenced against the footage when he could. Darth Maul was still out there, he was still trying to kill Obi-Wan, and Anakin wanted to be ready. If anybody could protect his master, it would have to be him. Darth Maul wasn't in front of him, but Satine was. Or at least, she looked like Satine. I contemplated other faces. She sat over her shoulder. She was clad in the white and golden armor of the GD Guardians, moving through their katas with grace and deadly precision. Mortis was a possibility, but you may have believed it was truly him, and rejected his offer a second time. The daughter and the son could have served, but I had no desire to threaten or frighten you. The figure of Satine finished the last of the set, and switched the saber staff off, making a face at the weapon, before letting it fall out of her hands. It evaporated before it hit the floor. She smiled over at Anakin and crossed the cell to stand before him. 
You never answered my question. Who is it you respect Star Child? Anakin tried to speak, but his mouth felt like it was filled with sand, or that he hadn't brushed his teeth in days. He swallowed and rasped, Obi-Wan, Yoda, Rex, Ahsoka, but it's good you didn't choose her. She nodded, looking contemplative. You extend your respect as rarely as your friendship. Why is that, Star Child? Why do you withhold your trust from so many? They started it. He thought, then regretted it before remembering that it didn't matter here. This was his mind, and she heard it anyway. If this is my mind, can I change this? He asked, one hand gesturing out at, nothing really, the walls and mats and wholeness of it. She arched a brow but nodded. Anakin waved a hand and the walls melted away, to be replaced with the wide open spaces of 500 Republica, the sheer drapes and plush softness of Patton's apartment. It was still silent, still frozen, he couldn't even smell the scent her handmaiden sometime left in little vials around the common spaces. But it was familiar, and it was safe, and Anakin knew where everything in the kitchen was. He was thirsty, he left the figure of Satine behind him, and got a glass down from the cabinet and filled it at the sink. After draining and refilling the glass two more times, Anakin felt steady enough to turn around and look at her. She'd seated herself at the little table tucked into the corner of the kitchen, once again foregoing chairs entirely to sit on the tabletop, her ankles crossed and daintily swinging in the air. It looks strange, in the guardian armor. I've never seen Satine wear anything but fancy clothes and jewelry. This smile was new, a curl of her lips into something feline and playful. Satine Chris was still Mandai, for all she longed to leave that violence behind her. You may remember her in finery, but my shield of light does not. Anakin's brow furrowed. How does that work? If we're in my mind, aren't you pulling this from my memories? Somehow, the arch of her brows contrived to be approving. Yes and no. I chose Satine because she had the qualities I needed, but I have watched her from different eyes over the years. My shield of light and the father of sons knew her well, but Padden's memories are helpful too. How can you use Padden's memories? She's not force sensitive. Then Anakin's thoughts caught up with this theoretical discussion and his hair trait picked up. Padden. The visions. The legend of Darth Plagueis the wise. Palpatine's promise. He looked back at her, Padden. Is she if you're the force, can you do you know what's happening to her? Satine nodded. I do. Can you stop it? Anakin asked, begged. He begged. Can you stop her from dying? When? What do you mean when? Anakin's heart was going a light year a minute, and the only thing that stopped him from throwing something at her, was the knowledge that Pat liked these glasses, and didn't want things broken in her apartment. She's I've been having visions. She's going to die in childbirth, and I can't was Palpatine right. Can he save her? Satine received this in patient silence, and took a moment to contemplate before finally saying, from a certain point of view, yes he can. He narrowed his eyes. Will you stop talking in circles and just tell me? I don't have time for GD riddles. My riddles are my own, they are not owned by the GD or the Sith. She said primly, then smiled when he began grumbling under his breath. But I take your meaning. What you seek is a way to protect Patton from suffering the fate you see in your visions, yes. Yes. That is up to you, Star Child. That depends on your choices. But I can tell you that if you heed my words, she will not die in childbirth, and nor will the children. Anakin gripped the counter behind him, and it was the only thing that kept him upright. It was like a gun dark had been sitting on his chest, and suddenly he could breathe again. He felt every muscle in his body relax at once, and it was only that last word that kept him from passing out again, right there on Padden's kitchen floor. Children. He whispered. She nodded, smiling again. Yes, my star child. If all goes to plan, Pat will give birth to twins, and they will be powerful, and they will be lovely. Now he did slide down to the floor, he couldn't help it, his legs had turned to jelly, and his heart had turned to mush. Twins he repeated softly, words filled with wonder. We're having twins. Satine slid down from the table and joined him on the floor, once again folding her legs beneath her. He was about to ask her how comfortable she was, sitting like that in full armor, when he realized their setting had changed again. They were nestled in the roots of the biggest tree Anakin had ever seen. The branches spread out above them like a stain of green across the sky, while shafts of light fell all around them, dappling the ground and his skin in soothing patches of warmth. Around them, he could see more trees, more green, more branches and more light. Where are we? He asked. I've never been here. Kashik. She answered. She had tipped her head back and closed her eyes, seeming to enjoy the sun on her skin. 
Anakin had never really understood why Obi-Wan loved Satine, but then he never flirted with Ventress either. Maybe Obi-Wan was only attracted to people who scared him. There may be something to what you say she responded, relaxing back against the tree. Anakin scrunched his nose. Will you stop that? Even if we're in my mind, you don't have to know everything. Satine opened her eyes again, looking puzzled. But I do know it, Star Child. I know the whole of you, just as I know the whole of all my Force Sensitives. Anakin considered that. Well, can you leave the stuff I don't say alone? It's just it's creepy, okay? She looked at him funny but shrugged. As you wish. It will make some of this harder for you. Anakin waved her off. Yeah, okay, whatever. What did you mean, from a certain point of view? Satine scrunched her own nose. Her nose was too thin for proper scrunching, it just looks silly. Patience, young one. She sat and it was such a perfect impression of Obi-Wan that all he could do was laugh. But he would not be deterred from his goal. You said I could save her. How do I do it? What do I have to do? Satine sighed, I shouldn't be surprised that you walk straight through the water to reach the shore. You can't walk through water, you have to swim. He said, just to be contrary. But she smiled anyway. That is my point. I wish you to swim, I wish to explain the context of our troubles before I start demanding anything of you. I have seen you grow up, my star child, and I have seen how you jump in without checking the depth of the water. And I have seen how you blame others for your soaking robes, when they have tried to caution you to look before you leap. Anakin wanted to protest. Any other day, he would have protested, and he could feel the words leap to his tongue. But this time, he was able to swallow them back. Maybe it was the soft wind, maybe it was her penetrating stare, maybe it was the fact that he was well rested for the first time in what felt like months. He wasn't in a hurry, he wasn't under fire, he wasn't being tested or judged or compared to anyone. He had nothing to prove, not to her. She wore Satine's face, but this person was not Satine. She was the force, and she would not judge him. Anakin lulled his head to the side and looked her in the eyes. Why do you call me that? She blinked. What do you mean? Starchild. My name is Anakin. But you are Starchild, she insisted. It is your true self, it is who you are in your heart, in my heart. Starchild is what the mechanic called you when you first opened your eyes, what she asked for when she prayed to me. His throat was suddenly very dry. He whispered, the mechanic. Satine furrowed her brows. What is the word for it, the one who carries you, bears you, brings you into the galaxy? He swallowed. My mother. You mean my mom? She nodded. Mother, thank you. She prayed for you beneath the two suns, so I took a part of myself and shared it with her. I will admit to some mercenary intentions in that action, but mostly here she paused, and he saw a faint blush begin to warm her face, the mechanic was lovely, and she walked in balance from the moment she opened her eyes. How could I deny her? Anakin had known all of this for years, of course. His mom had told him this story, but he'd always privately believed it was a folk tale to cover a more horrible truth. His genome had been sequenced at the temple, and they had declared him a perfectly standard human, with a few recessive traits, and a tendency towards insomnia that may or may not have been genetic. It hadn't mattered in the long run, except in the sense that his mother had not been raped, and for that he was grateful. It was entirely different to look into the face of the other half of his soul, and say, did you love her? Her blush deepened. Of course, of course I do, star child. She told him, she reached out to grasp and squeeze his hand. I love all who can use my gifts, but especially those who find their way to my side. I love you very much. My star child. My son. He felt a tear slip from his eye, and he reached to wipe it away, sniffing and turning his face, until he was sure he could speak without his voice cracking. She waited, silent and patient, and her hand was cool and smooth around his. If he swallowed again, Kriv. If mom was the mechanic, and I'm star child, who was you said father of sons and and shield of light. Are they? Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi. She supplied, and her eyes too were very bright. A very good place to start, if you're ready for my explanations. He took a breath and nodded. Okay, yeah. I already kinda know what you're gonna say though. Her brows rose, oh. He nodded, resigned. I'm the chosen one, I have to bring balance to the force and destroy the dark side. Satine flinched and shifted away, pulling her hand from his as if she'd been burned. Destroy the dark side. No. You can't you mustn't. Absolutely not. He blinked, why not? That's what the prophecy. Whatever prophecy your GD have passed down through the years is no concern of ours, star child. She exclaimed. 
He'd seen Satine looking this afraid only once, staring down a traitor with a blaster in her hands. I speak of balance, not death. It is this very thought that has led to all our problems. Anakin looked at her, feeling the concern and conviction in her words. I don't understand. He told her. Satine let out a breath and stood, closing her eyes tightly and clenching her fists. She moved away from their seat in the roots of these great trees, and began to pace through the dirt before him. Her steps kicked up clouds of dust that settled on her white boots. Anakin unfolded himself as well, but she held out a hand when he made to follow her down. How much history have you been taught? She asked, it was almost a demand. How much do you know of the last Sith Empire? He shrugged. The Jedi fought back against the Sith until their final defeat at the Battle of Rusin. When the Republic was founded, the Army of Light was disbanded, and the Jedi were shifted to a peacekeeping role in the new government. Up until Qui-Gon was killed, everyone thought the Sith were extinct. Of course, now we've got all these new Sith running around with. He stopped. Darth Plagueis was my master. He taught me the key to his power, before I killed him. Dot, the Chancellor is the Sith Lord we've been looking for. He said, turning over the words in his mouth and in his mind. He said that, he he told me. But I but that didn't. Sidious is a Sith, yes. Satine agreed, still pacing. He has been interfering in your upbringing and in the galaxy for the past 50 years. He is the one who stole my sword of night, the one who ordered my father of sons killed. He is the one who commissioned the army of slaves, who commanded the duelist and the last night sister, and that poor abomination of a Kalish. Sidious is the one who twice ordered the death of Padme, and now is killing her himself. He is the one who has tried to separate you from your shield of light time and time again. He is the one running both sides of this conflict, and sent thousands of your soldiers and your Jedi family to die. Sidious is the one who commanded you to kill the duelist just days ago. She said all this rapidly and distractedly, as if she didn't know that her every word was like a blaster bolt to the chest commissioned the army of slaves. Dot. That meant the clones, that meant hiring Jango Fett, but wasn't Master Sifor Dias the one who but Dooku had been the one who put the idea in Sifor Dias' head, and if he was already a Sith when he asked. Commanded you to kill the duelist, just days ago. Dot. Did that mean Dooku? But it hadn't been a command, had it? Anakin knew that Dooku was too dangerous to live, that he could stop the war and avenge hundreds of clones and Jedi with the flick of his wrists and, but no, that wasn't right, was it? He'd known it wasn't, he'd said it wasn't as soon as Dooku's head hit the floor, he'd said it before, they were supposed to arrest him, he and Obi-Wan, if they could, they weren't supposed to murder unarmed combatants, even if they were Sith Lords. Ordered my father of sons Kel Dotmal had been the apprentice, not the master, when he killed Qui-Gon. And if Dooku was always following his orders without question, it would make sense that Maul would have questioned his master even less. Obi-Wan had done his research this time around, and it was clear that Maul had been raised from infancy to be what he was. Ordered Padden killed. Ordered Padden killed, twice dot and now. He's killing her himself. Satine froze, then jerked her head up to him, eyes hazy. It took a moment to bring her focus back to him, to the here and now, instead of wherever her mind had rushed off to. Yes star child. He's filling your head with terror, to bring you to his side. And once he has you, Padden dies. That was always his aim. Anakin stumbled backward and lost his footing, landing hard on his ass, and sliding down off the roots of the tree that was no longer above him, now it was a dune in the searing light of the Tatooine suns. His back and legs were already warm as he sank back into the sand, as the dune sea cradled him into a sitting position that was too relaxed for his surge of black hatred. He's the one that kills Pan. I didn't see him in my visions, how could I not see him? I saw Obi-Wan, he's there with her but Anakin leapt to his feet, which was somewhat more difficult than it sounded. How is he doing it? How do I stop him? How do I stop her dying? Satine moved toward him again, one hand outstretched towards him, palm out. Peace, star child, peace. There is time, I need you calm if you are to gain understanding. You said there wasn't time. You said you couldn't freeze time forever, that's why we're here in my mindscape instead of in Palpatine's office. Both can be true, from a certain point. Stop quoting Obi-Wan. Why can't you just tell me? Because if you do not understand then our time here is pointless she shouted. I cannot tell you what you need to know if you will not listen, and if you will not listen, then I will lose them all over again. Lose who? All of you. The voice reverberated around and through them, echoing into the sky and into his bones. Satine tossed her head back with a scream, throwing her hands up and out in frustration. 
All around them, the sand of the desert was thrown away in a great heave of force, tossing a great billowing cloud of dust into the air, and leaving them in a crater of sand with dunes surrounding them on all sides. In the ringing silence, she continued in a double voice, one that he felt thrumming through his chest, thrumming through his mind. If you do not listen to me, your choices will not change. And if you choose poorly, they will die and keep dying, until all of my children and all of my gifts and all of my wonders are vanished from the galaxy. I need you to listen, I need you to find understanding, I need you to save us. And then, softer now, Satine said, I need you to save me, star child my son. Please. I need your help. And, in the ringing silence, Anakin said, all of your children. You mean, all all the four sensitives. All the GD. Everyone. She nodded, and when he drew nearer he could see her eyes were filled with tears. I have seen what will happen if you join him, star child. I have felt it as the lives of my children are snuffed out in the thousands, in the hundreds, dwindling and disappearing until all that's left is the lonely girl. The lonely girl, Finn, and their dear pilot. They're all that is left of me, of us, and I cannot see what will happen when they are gone. I do not know what happens when there are no children to give my strength to. I do not know what will happen. Anakin could see the scope of it spiraling out around them, the white inky expanse of the galaxy filled with stars and systems and hyper-roots and lives, and he could see it as the Force did, feel it as she did, feel the thousands of lights all around the galaxy as they flickered, and they danced. And they died. He saw it and felt it, as all those GD, all those who could feel the Force, were snuffed out on a massive scale in what felt like an instant, leaving it all that much darker, that much emptier. They disappeared so fast, and then slower, and then slower still until the sky was just void. Just void, but for the two pinpricks of light that glimmered there, solitary and silent in the sky. Anakin remembered a riddle that had been posed on his first, and last, day in intergalactic philosophy. The master had stood before them and written on the holoprog, if a tree falls in a forest, and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? If there was nobody to feel the force, was it still there? Anakin reached out and pulled the force to him, tucked her head under his chin and held her there. Her arms closed around his back and together they stood, shaking and weeping and holding on to each other like their lives depended on it. Because, in a very real way, they did. When he opened his eyes again, they were in the GD temple. But it was not his GD temple. Anakin could feel it, in the way the minds and spirits moved around them, in the number of people walking and running through the corridors, in the way the whole building was filled with a sense of peace and light that was so long past that Anakin almost didn't remember it. Satine stepped out of his arms after one last grateful squeeze, and now she'd exchanged her gold and white armor for a set of GD robes in many different shades of gray, with her trousers and boots in black, and her uppermost layers in white. It wasn't very subtle, but it was fitting. Her hair was longer too, longer than he had ever seen, and it fell over one shoulder in a thick golden braid. You ask why you could not destroy the dark side. She said, her voice hushed and solemn. When he nodded, she shrugged. The simplest answer is because there is no dark side or light side. I am one force, splitting my gifts and wonders in half is limiting and misguided. Okay Anakin said, even though it really wasn't. You say that, and I want to believe you because you're, you know, the Force, but... But you are a warrior she finished his sentence with a smile and a twinkle in her eye, not a monk. You require evidence, something you can hold in your hands. He shrugged and smiled. Guilty. I, ah he rubbed the back of his neck, feeling very sheepish. She was the Force, she was in all intents and purposes his father, but it still felt like the words were sticking in his throat. I think I've no, I know I've touched the dark side before. It, uh, it felt really strange. Strange was entirely the wrong word for it, but how was he supposed to say that it felt like dying and flying at the same time? That he'd felt like something feral and unkillable, like nothing was impossible for him, like he was burning alive and bleeding from the eyes, and didn't care until hours later when he realized what he'd done, and the shame and guilt could rock him to his core. How horrified he had been at himself after he choked Poggle the Lesser, horrified that he'd done it, but also at how little he'd cared, how little it had mattered in comparison to saving Ahsoka. How he knew then and now that he'd do it all over again. How he had done it all over again. With Ventress, with that slaver queen, with Clovis. He justified it when it happened, that they were bad people, that they deserved it, that they deserved worse, that he'd left them alive, and that was a kind of mercy, right? Anakin knew that those excuses would never persuade Obi-Wan, or Ahsoka, or Padm, or the Council. He could barely persuade himself. Satine looked into his eyes and nodded. She knew anyway. 
follow me. She turned on her heel and began walking briskly down the hallway, leaving Anakin to trail in her wake a risk losing her in the crush of people. She wove through initiates and padawans and knights and masters with ease, at times seeming to walk straight through them. Anakin was taller and should have been faster, but he was almost jogging to keep up. As they turned into the atrium, Anakin was about ready to ask her where they were meant to be going when he saw himself. Anakin's steps faltered, slowed, and stopped. Standing in the wide open hall, staring up and around at everything, was him, aged nine, still in his tattoo iron tunic and trousers. Obi-Wan was standing behind him, hands on his shoulders, keeping him from getting swept away in the crowds. He'd been talking to, Anakin remembered, telling him about the history of the temple and the planet. Anakin hadn't been able to hear the words, just the rise and fall of his voice with its crisp chorus and lilt, too overwhelmed by the sensation of peace and motion in the air. Him, now, the Anakin he was, watched the Anakin he used to be turn his head and smile brightly at the giant of a man beside them both. Quite gone. He whispered, unable to tear his eyes away. Beside him, Satine hummed and murmured, father of sons, who did not raise even one of his boys to balance. He reached it early but could not teach it to you, not that he had the time it would require. But I think, perhaps, had my plans gone the way they were meant to, he could have shared the secret with you. What do you mean, plans? He asked and looked down at her, mostly to force himself to look away from the face of Master Jin. You keep saying that, what plans did you make? Satine looked up and she seemed almost sad. You were not my first attempt to correct what has gone wrong she admitted, her voice hushed. He moved closer, ducked his head to better hear. Before you, there was my experiment with counterweights, and before them, I sought a great heart to match the greatness of mind that was Plagius. Then there was Mortis, and further back it was she trailed off, looking down at her hands. Living balance is difficult, it has always been so. I have tried, so, so many times. The hall seemed to fade away from them, the noise and chatter muffled and distant as he stood there, feeling the shame and humble acceptance that shone from Satine. Anakin wasn't sure what the right thing to do here was, but he reached out and touched her shoulder. Hey, you're supposed to be explaining things to me. Understanding, you said. She took in a deep breath, let it out, and when Satine looked up at him, it was with thankful smile and tired eyes. Yes, my star child. Understanding. We will start here. She snapped her fingers, and Anakin blinked in the deep orange light of a Coruscant sunset. It only looked this warm and golden in one's place, and he turned his head to see they had moved to the North Spire, to the chambers of the High Council. He knew this feeling. It had felt this way while he answered the questions of the intimidating adults around him, while Qui-Gon stood behind him, tall, strong, and implacable. It had never felt that way again, after Qui-Gon died. Can you see them? Satine was no longer at his side. She was across the room, walking slowly behind the masters, one hand trailing along the back of their chairs. Have you learned to see inside, or is it something else this order denies you? You mean four signatures? Anakin did his best to keep his eyes on her, and not the people in this room that he knew to be dead. Not the boy in the middle of the room, who was about to lie to Yoda and think he's getting away with it. Yeah, I learned from Master Yoda in initiate classes. Sati nodded, murmuring, same story, different words. She nodded again, more sharply, and raised her gaze to his again. Focus, star child. Focus on the signatures, tell me what you see. In fact, to do this Anakin had to unfocus. He had to slip back away from his conscious mind just enough that his force sense could bleed into his senses more completely, but not enough to reach a trance state. That had never been a danger with him anyway, Anakin was privately sure he'd never reached that deep meditative state that Obi-Wan and Yoda talked about, the one the old Jedi sages had used to find their prophecies so many centuries ago. He could do moving meditation no problem, and battle meditation was like breathing for him, after so many months at the front. But a deep trace. He would never reach it. When he opened his eyes again, he was almost forced to close them in the glare of white light that surrounded him. Instead of the Jedi Masters in their thrones, he was looking at nearly a dozen pillars of light, bright and pure and nearly blinding. Anakin squinted and looked around, seeking someone he could even make out the features of. Obi-Wan Kenobi, at 24, wasn't nearly as luminous with the light as Anakin knew he would become. He heard Qui-Gon Jinn as if from far away, though Anakin remembered the words. He hadn't remembered the flash of hurt and frustration on Obi-Wan's face, when Qui-Gon casually told the council that he would teach Anakin instead. He saw it too, a swirl of heat and darkness that collected in Obi-Wan's chest, settled there in his belly. 
headstrong. Qui-Gon was saying of Obi-Wan, and he has much to learn about the living force, but he is capable. There is little more he will learn from me. Anakin started at the words, turned to look at Qui-Gon Jinn, this giant of a man that Anakin had recalled with so much awe. He was so dismissive, like he didn't realize how a backhanded compliment like that could reflect on Obi-Wan, or how it would hurt him. Obi-Wan had never spoken an ill word about his master, not to Anakin. He tried his best to paint Qui-Gon in the best possible light. Of course, Obi-Wan had been dismissive to Anakin several times, but he almost always came back with an apology, usually that same day. The few times he hadn't there had usually been a firefight, or a bout of unconsciousness involved. You are one of the most powerful GD I have ever had the privilege to meet. Palpatine had said once, more than once. I doubt very much that your master can keep you from reaching the heights you seek for much longer. It made sense to him at the time that Obi-Wan would resent him. He was only teaching Anakin because of a promise made to his dying master, a master that had all but repudiated him in favor of teaching this sand-crusted nine-year-old. Anakin had sent Obi-Wan's frustration with him time and time again, he'd been irritated that Anakin couldn't grasp what temple raised younglings half his age had always known and overwhelmed when Anakin progressed faster than Obi-Wan could keep up. It was natural, expected even, to see Anakin as a burden to be endured. But those words rang hollow now, somehow far away and empty. What echoed instead was the image of Obi-Wan's smile at the transport last evening, his warm hand heavy on Anakin's shoulder, his absolute sincerity. You are strong and wise my friend, and I am very proud of you. He looked at the Obi-Wan here in this memory, who was now ushering his nine-year-old self out of the room. The dark was still there, in his belly, but already it was fading away. He remembered what Obi-Wan had said to him when the doors had closed. You did very well, Ani. You passed all the tests with flying colors, just like we knew you would. Anakin had looked down at his feet. I don't think they liked me. Obi-Wan had smiled then, so full of warmth and worry, even only after a few days knowing him. Give them time. If the council is anything like me or Padma Captain Panaka, they'll be wrapped around your little finger by this time tomorrow. You think Pad likes me? Of course she does Anakin, who wouldn't? Anakin had an answer for that too, and he scowled to see that Satine had stepped around to stand in front of his chair, leaning in and staring into the face of Master Windu. Here was another person he could see through the glare of white light, though he bracketed on both sides by GD that were engulfed in that radiance. In fact, Anakin couldn't see any shine on him at all, nor any darkness. Fascinating. Satine murmured, reaching out as if to touch the face of the Grand Master of the Order. Her fingertips hovered along the curve of his cheekbone, and she ghosted them over Windu's cheek and chin, before lowering to light at the hollow of his throat. He keeps it all right here, locked behind his teeth. How did you accomplish this without my notice, Abba? Well I have certainly been busy, you would think I would have seen you. Can you stop that? Anakin crossed his arms, suddenly feeling very small. What did Master Windu do that so important? Aren't you supposed to be helping me? Satine smiled, looking at him out of the corner of her eye. Now now, star child, there is no need to be jealous. You are still my chosen son, but what kind of parent would I be if I played favorites? I'm not jealous. Anakin muttered, knowing it was a lie. I just don't see why everyone is so fooled by him, like he's some great and wise leader. He's never been anything but a carking Winbekia to me. Now she did turn to look at him, and arched one delicate eyebrow. Maybe that was where Obi-Wan had learned his favorite trick. He is only a mortal man, star child, we must forgive them their flaws. Would it help you to forgive, if you understood his perspective? I know his perspective. Anakin scowled at the floor. He doesn't think I'm good enough to be the chosen one, even though I'm the strongest GD in the last 50 years, one of the greatest duelists in the order, have commanded and won almost 200 battles across dozens of planets. And these accomplishments are meant to gain his respect. What? His thoughts sputtered to a stop. No. I know. That's not why I he trailed off, confused. But that is something you want, yes? She asked, her icy blue eyes unblinking. The respect of the people in this room. Shouldn't I have earned it by now? He snapped back. He began pacing around the room, passing luminous being after shining light. They've been watching me my whole life, just waiting for me to mess up. I don't know what they want from me, especially Winter. What is it going to take for them to accept me as one of them? One of this council? One of the GD. He yelled, throwing an arm out to gesture to the council. One of the order. I don't know what more I have to do to prove to them that I belong here. 
Their eyes flashed and for a moment Anakin remembered the fallen, remembered the sand, remembered the running and the fighting. You in this room said this to you. Her words were low and dangerous, and she narrowed her eyes at the man she'd just been fascinated by. Which one of these GD masters the derision dripped from her words as she sneered, would tell my chosen one that he didn't belong among them. Who would dare speak to you like that? You're a child. You're my child. It wasn't like that Anakin hastened to tell her. He thought about reaching out and pulling her away from Windu's chair, decided against it. They didn't use those words, exactly. What did they say? I dunno, it was a long time ago. He didn't know what to do with his hands. It was kid stuff, mostly. Other initiates would bring up me being a slave, just to get me in trouble when I hit them. Rankasus has always been suspicious of me, he kept giving me punishments that were really overkill whenever I messed up, and he always thought I had messed up. And now that he had to say all of this out loud, it didn't sound like much at all, certainly not enough to fuel this resentment that had been boiling in his belly since before he could remember. And today. I told Master Windu that Palpatine was the Sith Lord, I went straight to him. And, you know what he said to me. Satine blinked, then waved a hand. Immediately, the memory of Mace Windu stood from his chair, looked at him with exhaustion and determination, and said, If this is true, you will have earned my trust. Anakin didn't start, he didn't, but he did find himself a few inches back from where he'd been a second ago. Satine was looking at Windu again, the one who stood in the council chambers with him. Without him noticing, the rest of the masters had disappeared, all of that light was gone, and they were bathed in the sunset again. Why yeah, that. Anakin said, gesturing towards Windu's face. What does he mean, if? Why would I lie about something like that? Does he think I'm some spy for Palpatine? That I was betraying the GD? That I? Was I? What was I going to say to them, in the Chancellor's office? What was I running for? He broke off, the words caught in his throat. It felt like the floor was unbalancing beneath his feet, like the whole planet was spinning on his head, while he stared into the frozen face of Master Windu, while he remembered the scene in Chancellor Palpatine's office, the lightning storm that had crackled around Windu and Palpatine, the terrible rage on Windu's face. Anakin fisted his hands in his hair and tried and tried and tried to push the feelings away, tuck them into the back of his head as he'd been doing for years, but it was all so much, and he was so scared and so confused and... Why do you hate me so much? He shouted at the master Windu that stood before him, knowing as he said it that it was a futile effort. What did I ever do to make you treat me this way? What did I do to you? The mace Windu in his head was as inscrutable and silent as the true grandmaster waiting for him when he woke up, Anakin knew he would find no answers from him. Satine, however, was watching him with soft eyes, a hand brought to her mouth, fingertips just brushing her lips. After a moment, she said, you frightened him. Anakin screwed up his eyes, shook his head. He didn't understand. What? You frightened him, star child. She took a step toward him, another, then she reached up to untangle his hands from his own hair, holds them in her own. He sees how strong you are, and how strongly you feel, and it scares him. He's afraid of you, and he's afraid for you. It was so painful, to hear those words, but it was familiar too. Anakin had always known, deep down, that nobody on the council really thought he was the chosen one, never really thought he was a GD, they were all just waiting for Anakin blinked, frowned. Wait, afraid for me. That that can't be right. Satine's brow smoothed out as she smiled at him. I've seen him through your eyes, through the eyes of all these GD, through his own. You are very much alike, it seems. He cannot see you clearly, star child, Abba is too distracted by his own flaws that he sees reflected in you. None of that could be true, could it? No, that's we're nothing alike. He's he's not I'm not like him. I'm nothing like him, he's he's so. Strong she was speaking softly, slowly, as if she were trying to gentle a skittish veractile, and loyal. Capable, a talented duelist and fierce warrior. Withholding of his trust, for fear of being betrayed. And he feels, star child. Abba feels as much as you, as deeply as you do. Anakin shook his head. I don't believe you, I, I've never seen Master Windu feel anything. Satine arched an eyebrow, and Anakin refused to feel chastised. Would you like to see? She asked. What? But the scenery was already changing around them, the room shrinking and darkening into the exceptionally dirty hold of a freighter. Anakin felt like he was shrinking and darkening as well, his perspective was shifting downward as they turned in place, as Mace Windu rose above him to the intimidating size that he remembered from his first day in the temple. 
They were shouting all around them, and Windu stood tall, his saber in one hand and the other stretched out, tossing crates of cargo through the wide open bay doors. Anakin shrank back from the blaster fire, but Windu ricocheted every bolt with precision, tossing every red blast back towards their attackers. The last bolt went into the panel next to the bay doors, and they closed way more quickly than was safe for a freighter this sold and damaged. No sooner than the shooting stopped did Windu grab a holocom from his belt and snap, croon, take off, now. The ship's thrusters kicked on, and Anakin felt his eardrums pop as the freighter shot upwards at a speed that was considered dangerously reckless by people who weren't him. He wasn't that surprised that Master Plo Koon was flying like this, he'd been the best pilot in the order until Anakin got his official certification a few years ago. They'd race. He'd won. Plo Koon had laughed. Master Windu put away his calm and switched off his saber, the purple blade receding into the chromium hilt. He turned around then, and only then did Anakin realize just how young Windu must be here. The lines on his forehead and around his eyes were missing, and he still had hair. It's alright now Windu said, in a voice that Anakin had never heard from him before. It was gentle, almost hesitant. It's all over. We're safe. When Windu moved towards him, Anakin was convinced that the Force hadn't found a memory at all, and had plucked him out of his life and dropped him into Windu's, some 30 years in the past. He shrank back against the crate he ducked behind for cover, but Windu kept going, stepping past Anakin and going down on one knee closer to the back of the hold. The pirates are gone, they can't get to us anymore. Windu said. It was only then that Anakin noticed the three younglings huddled together in the back corner. Two humans, one boy one girl, and what looks like an Aqualish toddler, being held in the arms of the boy. They looked half starved and terrified, and the boy only had one shoe. You're safe now Windu said again, with a pulse of serenity and trust put into the words. I promise. It took a moment, but eventually the girl stepped out from behind the crates, walked across to Windu and looked into his face with a guarded but unafraid stare. Blue eyes, deep brown skin, black hair tied back in a thick braid, her nose had a hook to it, that would only grow more pronounced as she grew from a girl to a stunningly beautiful woman. That's Master Balabo. Anakin thought, seeing the fierce warrior and patient teacher she would become. This is the day they met. I didn't know Master Windu was the one to bring her home to the temple. Where are you taking us? Deepa Balaba said, her chin high and voice steady. Windu smiled at her. We are going to the GD temple on Coruscant. There, the three of you will be safe and welcome. There will be teachers there to help you learn the ways of the Force. Deepa scrunched her face in confusion, and Anakin could hear the amusement and affection clanging in Windu's heart. I don't have the Force. She spoke. I have a shine. Anakin's heart stuttered. A shine. That's what they called it, in the slave quarters, in the bellies of cargo ships, in the deep sea mines. You didn't call it the force, it wasn't safe, a force-sensitive slave was a gold mine to the right buyer, and no self-respecting slave master would leave money on the table if they could help it. So, your baby had a shine. The oldest mammies, the hunched over abbas, they showed you how to hide it, how to trick the guards into thinking it was coincidence or a lucky break. If the mothers and children were separated, you got word to another mammy about your shine, and they would do what they could to keep the children from being noticed. His mom had been one of those mammies. She'd done her best to hide his shine, just like she'd hidden her own. She'd hidden his shine for nine years, until Qui-Gon came to call and hiding it would do more harm than good. Had she known he was coming. Next to him, Satine nudged his shoulder. They were both in initiate's robes, though hers were blue where his were beige. Focus, star child. She said, her voice high with that precocious Karaskanti accent that the Mandai probably resented. Look at him. What do you see? Anakin shook himself, there he went again, letting his thoughts spiral away from him instead of staying in the present moment. He unfocused his eyes a little and looked back at Windu, and almost snapped back to material reality from the shock alone. Windu was swathed in the dark. It was dripping off him, clinging to his clothes and pulling an oil slick sludge at his feet. He reached out his hands to Deepa, and the dark burbled up from his palms, dripping down his forearms in long ropey strands. He opened his mouth to say, yes you do, all three of you have a shine, and it poured out of his mouth in a thin sheet to drip down his chin. He couldn't help it, Anakin lurched backward, lost his balance and landed with a hard thump right on his butt. He stayed there, shaking, as Windu took Deepa Balaba by the hand, and led her and the two of the rescued slaves out of the hold and into the ship, hopefully to a medbay that was equipped with a doctor droid, that could do delicate surgery. 
Satine stayed crouched next to him, though her eyes stayed on the hull doors as they whisked shut again. There was a jolt that told Anakin that the ship had entered hyperspace. He registered it from a distance, her eyes were still glued to the pools of oily darkness left behind on the cargo bay floor, the footsteps of ink that led deeper into the freighter. W what's wrong with him? Anakin managed to get the words out, though his throat felt it had been filled with sand. Why is why is he like that? What's wrong? Satine turned to him, blankly. There's nothing wrong with him. She said. Oh of course there is. He was all Anakin gesture to the space where Windu had once been, to the rainbow slick sludge that was still there, why was it still there? All dark. What happened? Satine blinked, then said, he rescued three of my children from slavers, star child. He is overrun with his emotions and will be for some time. That is what it looks like, when the fire is burning you inside out. Didn't look like fire Anakin breathed. It looked like poison. Satine nodded. An apt description, at times. I am the force, and my gifts take many shapes, and in their many uses and users, I have collected many names. What you call the light, some think of as a kind of ice. That kind of serenity can be strong and implacable, and only ice can soothe the burns that this galaxy can leave behind in the minds and hearts of my children. What you call the dark, perhaps can be thought of as fire, as a way to fuel your strength. That is the way the Sword of Night thinks of it, and he is closer to the truth of the matter than his master has ever been. But there are limitations to any words used to describe my gifts. Anakin was still staring at the pools of oil slick that were only now, finally, fading away into nothingness again. Something can be thought of he repeated, feeling entirely too weary for a 23 year old. Are you ever gonna give me a straight answer? She smiled one of her dangerous smiles. I am not a problem on your arithmetic exam, star child. I contain the galaxy, the void, the force users and you. There is no formula to solve the question of what I am. I am not a question. Anakin blew out his breath, making his lips flap. So, no. He shoved himself up to his feet and started towards the cargo bay doors, carefully edging around the footsteps that were still filled with darkness. Is there something else here you wanted me to see? Satine jumped to his side with a sunny smile. There is, actually. Come. She took the lead, winding their way through the ship until they reached the cockpit where they found Master Kuhn and Windu, both looking tired but satisfied. Anakin very deliberately did not unfocus his eyes, he could feel a swirl of emotions buffeting behind Windu's shields, and he really didn't want to see the Grand Master bleeding black for the second time in 20 minutes. The girl seemed strong. Master Kuhn was saying, one hand on the steering column, the other tapping at his respirator. She didn't flinch once. 16 vaccinations Windu said, and Anakin winced in extremely belated sympathy. Never even shied away. I'm not sure she'll mesh well with other younglings in her age group, if she's used to taking on responsibility this young. You're thinking too far in the future, Knight Windu. Plo Koon said. Remember, a seeker's job is to protect the younglings and bring them safely to the temple, not to worry after them all their lives. Her crush masters will know better than us how to make sure she settles in. Windu took in a deep breath, and let out a sigh that seemed to echo to the bottoms of his feet. Does anybody actually believe that line? He asked, turning a half-smile back towards the view screen, still filled with star lines. Plo Koon laughed in his muffled way, the kind of laugh that always got Snips laughing too. That's right, Master Kuhn was the seeker that brought Ahsoka to the temple, and they'd shared a special bond that Anakin had tried very hard not to be jealous of. Maybe there was something to Windu's question. Kuhn answered, we try to keep it in mind, even if we do not always succeed. I know how your master feels about attachment. Learn to let go, you must. Windu said, in a fairly accurate impression of Yoda. Avoid pain, you will. Count, Master Yaddle does not. Anakin was startled into laughter and was even more startled to see Windu laughing too, to see him relax into it and lean back in the copolis chair, his hands falling loose in his lap, eyes closed, warm joy like a shaft of sunlight filling up the cockpit. He was too curious, and when he unfocused his eyes again, Windu was no longer dripping in darkness. The dark was there, but instead of an oil slick stain, it was a loose and hazy cloud, slowly easing around and through him, around his head, into his chest, something purple and shadowed but not dangerous, not sickening. It looked like what the laughter felt like, a release of worry, of fear, of anger. It felt like contentment, companionship. Is this what it looks like, when I manage to make Obi-Wan laugh? When Snips tricks Rex into smiling. Have those deep dark clouds in my head been friendship all along? 
A little voice whispered from behind him, and Anakin opened his eyes. When had he closed them? And looked around. Can I um? Deepa Balaba stood at the edge of the doorway, down the short set of stairs that led to the cockpit on this junker of a ship. Her face and hair were clean and she had new clothes on, but she'd forgotten shoes in favor of sock feet, which was probably why she'd been able to sneak up on two GD knights. Plo Koon swung around in his seat and beamed down at her, which made her shrink back because Deepa had only met Plo Koon today, and didn't know which respirator movement meant smiling, and which meant frowning, yet. Yes, little one. Plo said, and all that warmth and care in his voice, seemed to ease her anxieties, at least a little. Are we? She trailed off, staring down at her toes. We're not there yet, right? No, not yet. Windu said, turning around as well. Was it Anakin's imagination or did Deepa's shoulders relax more when Master Windu spoke? We should reach Coruscant in three days' time, or thereabouts. Would you like to come up to the cockpit? Kroon asked kindly. Deepa stepped back and shook her head hard. No, that's fine. Please Kuhn said, standing and taking slow steps down the stairway, hands up, carefully not moving into her space. I was just going to get some sleep. I'd appreciate it if someone kept night wind to company. Deepa still shrank back against the wall, and only the prospect of an empty pilot's chair kept her from bolting. Is is that okay? She asked, so so softly. You'd be doing me a favor. Kuhn said, taking another step back, clearly indicating that he was heading a different direction than the way she'd come. I don't trust him not to fall asleep at the controls. Hey. Windu protested, and Anakin saw Deepa edge forward again, towards the voice of the one who protected her from pirates. Go ahead Plo Koon urged her, before deliberately turning his back and walking down the passageway. After another moment of consideration, Deepa Balaba did what she'd been desperately wanting to do, and scampered up the steps to the cockpit, wriggling into the pilot's seat and sat on her knees, staring wide-eyed at the star line streaming past the ship. Next to her, Windu watched with an expression of such fondness that it hurt Anakin to watch. How are we going this fast? Deepa murmured, craning her neck, trying to see everything at once. I didn't know ships could go this fast. We're using a hyper ring Windu answered, well, commandeering a hyper ring. GD business let us borrow it from the mining guild. And then they were off, Deepa peppering him with a thousand different questions that she honestly should have saved for Master Kuhn, because Windu didn't know anything about spaceships, and it showed. She didn't seem to mind his ignorance, and soon the questions shifted from ships to their destination to the temple and the GD, and what life would be like once they got there. At one point, Windu had to lift Deepa off the pilot's seat and into his lap, so she could see the hyper route map, and he let her trace her finger all along the Hydean way. She fell asleep there, not much longer than two hours later, tucked in beneath Windu's robes. Anakin's heart squeezed as he remembered doing the same thing with Obi-Wan more than a dozen times when he'd been young. When had that stopped being okay? When Deepa shifted and muttered, Thank you, Abba in her sleep, he saw tears shining in Mace Windu's eyes. He ducked his head to brush a kiss across Deepa's forehead, then went back to staring out into space. Anakin looked over at Satine, who was sitting cross-legged on the top step, chin in her hands, watching him with those ice blue eyes. Okay, so we're like. Anakin told her, and was proud of himself for not being sulky about it. He was five again, it would be perfectly justified. That doesn't justify him being shitty to me. Of course not. Satine shook her head. But you see my point. Yeah, okay. He looked back up at Windu, younger and kinder, and with more hair and more eyebrows. How did he do that? He whispered. He was all full of the dark, and then it just went away. How does he manage it? Satine shrugged. That, I do not know. Perhaps you could ask him yourself. When I wake up, you mean? When do I get to do that, by the way? Not yet. She said, dropping her feet to the top step and starting down the stairs. You have some pieces, but do not yet have understanding. Yeah, I think you got distracted. Anakin said, following her down the stairs, which were suddenly a lot longer than they had been a moment before. Yes and no. She said over her shoulder, now somewhere in her teens, her robes lengthening into something closer to a gown. We were speaking of balance, and Abba seems to be your best option to learn from. I mean, I guess. Anakin turned it over in his mind, those shining pillars of light in the council chambers, the ugly oil slick of darkness pouring out of window. The utter lack of either side that he'd worn by the time Deepa had fallen asleep in his arms. So, true balance is somewhere in the middle. Not fall into the dark and not fully light, but somewhere in that grey area. 
They had reached the bottom of the staircase, and now Anakin was himself again, dressed in his favorite sleep shirt and second favorite pair of trousers. I wore this on Naboo, he thought, and there was a sinking feeling in his stomach. And then I took Pat into Tatooine. Satine turned to smile at him. Very good, star child. Yes, finding peace in the in-between is what seems to be best, if we're talking about living balance. In theory, each of my children should be able to find that peace within themselves, but given the history of the galaxy, it has not always been so. It will be difficult for you to convince the GD that their convictions about the light and dark are wrong, but not impossible. And you will not be alone. Oh, great. His head already felt full to bursting. Just what I need, more responsibilities. You will not be alone. She repeated. She gestures to their surroundings, which he only now realizes is the palace of Theed. Our next step is to speak of counterweights. Counterweights. He repeated, while around them images of Padden's favorite clocks appeared out of thin air. There was an old world-style clock on Alderaan, a massive wonder of engineering, seven stories high and encased in spare steel, each delicate gear and cog and clockwork exposed to the sunlight. The whole thing was solar-powered and kept time by virtue of two enormous weights hanging from brass chains. Once a month they had to be ratcheted back up to their starting positions. He'd watched it happen once, when Obi-Wan had taken him to a treaty negotiation. He'd been twelve and bored out of his mind at the meetings, and he'd entertained himself by watching the movement of the clockworks and visualizing how all the little pieces fit together. As a reward for his good behavior, Obi-Wan had gotten them both a tour of the inner workings, and then found a halafla that involved a fight in a clock tower that was allegedly based on the Alderaanian wonder. The flick was part of a larger franchise, and for a solid year he and Obi-Wan had devoured all the vids and flicks they could get their hands on that involved that group of outlaws. Anakin had loved this Abrak with the fastest blaster in the galaxy, the one who smoked death sticks non-stop, while Obi-Wan had developed a soft spot for the lawman who chads their little yellow ship across planet after planet, but never seemed to catch them. That was the first time Ani had been able to really like Obi-Wan, not as a teacher or caretaker, but as a friend. Watching flicks with him, Obi-Wan was able to relax enough to be someone to laugh with, someone who didn't try to lecture Ani for swearing or forgetting to take his shoes off before he sat on the couch. There'd been a point where Ani could make Obi-Wan bust up in the middle of a diplomatic meeting, just by making a certain face. When had Obi-Wan stopped laughing with him? When had Anakin stopped trying to make him laugh? We were laughing outside the Senate Dome, he thought, just before everything went to pieces. Why does that feel like so long ago? It's been, what, a week? Satine smiled as the gears and machinery of the clock tower rose around them. Her gown had lightened to Alderaanian white, and her hair was now a crown of braids coiled atop her head. She stepped across a gap, light as a dancer, onto a white moving gear, and Anakin followed her steps as she traipsed from clockwork to clockwork, bringing them ever higher and deeper into the moving marvel. At the end of the last Sith War, the Jedi wiped out their empire and thought their ancient enemy defeated. She told Anakin, over her shoulder as they climbed. And that swell of death is where our troubles truly began. The Jedi had to destroy the Sith Empire. Anakin said, holding out a hand to steady her as she hopped across to a slower moving gear. They were creating monsters and poisoning worlds. Death is death, star child, however justified it may seem at the time. She drew him up the last stairs, and he found himself in the chamber at the top of the clock tower, hidden behind the faces. And a cultural genocide like that leaves scars, scars that have never been healed fully. They were committing genocide. Satine raised an eyebrow. And so, the GD answered violence with violence. Isn't the order supposed to be better than that? The only thing the Sith understand is violence. Anakin growled, feeling his hands curl into fists. Something the two great orders seem to have in common. Satine waved away his next protest. We are not here to debate history, star child. My point is this, of the thousands of sects, cults, and religions that follow my wisdom and reach for my power, only two have truly dominated. The Jedi and the Sith are the most powerful ideologies of all those who seek to understand me, and they are both wrong. See, you say that, but... The essential mission of both the Jedi Order and the Sith is destruction. Satine raised a hand, and a lightsaber appeared in it. When she activated it, the beam was a bright sanguine red. In her other hand, another saber appeared, this one shining blue. Both organizations seek the eradication of the other, a final tangible triumph of their view of the force over their rivals. 
She tossed the blades in the air, where they flipped hand over and in a dangerous ballet, twisting around each other as if at orbit, finally coming together in a clash of sparks and light that, for a moment, filled the room with blinding light. Anakin raised his hand to shield his eyes. And when he lowered his hand, they weren't alone in the clock tower. Standing in the center of the chamber, armed with their chosen weapons, were Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Maul. Wait Anakin said, watching his master and his most hated enemy circle each other like panthers, muscles tense and eyes wary, you said that Obi-Wan was a shield. Satine was at his elbow, her delicate hands looped around his arm, and slowly drawing him back from the fray. My shield of light, and his counterpart she nodded towards Mo, who was already leaping towards his foe, my sword of night. They clashed, and Anakin winced, although he already knew this fight, knew each breath and step and dodge like he had lived this encounter himself. His master was young here, clean-shaven, his Padawan braid dangling long over one shoulder. Darth Maul was taunting him, swathed in layers of black, his shimmering yellow eyes alight with hate. No, wait that wasn't right. Sure he was about to regret it, Anakin unfocused his eyes. The reactor room was awash with color, not bright white and deep blackness, but a swirling fire of reds and golds. Obi-Wan was the one with darkness swirling around him, the rage and pain and grief echoing through him, was only being egged on by Maul's own wildfire emotions. But Maul wasn't hateful, Maul wasn't even really angry. The black hatred that Anakin had experienced was swirling around Obi-Wan, but it was all but drowned out by the shimmering gold that could only be his grief. His grief and the ugly tang of his fear, but the fear wasn't for his own life, it was all tinged green and sickly-like. Anakin didn't want to, he really didn't want to look. But he did. Qui-Gon lay dying on the floor across the room, surrounded by a shimmering haze of greens and golds and glimmering white. He was in pain, and he was watching his Padawan and grieving for him, his boy that was so desperately trying to help his master, so desperate to believe he wasn't already gone. There was another clash and Anakin brought his eyes back to the fight, back to the interaction that always stopped his heart, every time, even though he knew the outcome, even though he knew that his master, his brother, his friend would get out of this unscathed. No, unscathed wasn't the right word. Alive, yes, but not unscathed. Maul was prowling around the edge of the reactor well, baring his teeth at the Padawan that dangled beneath him, inches from his doom. He was still surrounded by his wildfire of reds and oranges, and now Anakin could really see what this terror was feeling, and it was joy. A twisted kind of joy, a joy at the pain of others, an arrogance and pride that seemed to fill him up from the inside. All that anger and all that fire wasn't fueled by any kind of hatred, it was fueled by his triumph over these Jedi, his pride in his skill and his fierce joy in this fight, in the excitement and challenge of besting this. Obi-Wan exploded with light, tossing himself up and over Maul in a twisting flip, even as he called Qui-Gon's saber to his hand. Maul had just enough time to look shocked before he started looking bisected, but Obi-Wan didn't even stop to watch the assassin fall down the reactor shaft, he was already running to his master's side. Anakin turned his back, murmuring, we shouldn't watch this to Satine, who raised a hand and paused all sound and movement. After a moment of quiet, Anakin chanced to look at her face. Her eyes were filled with sadness, but her gaze wasn't trained on Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, but lay instead on the reactor shaft. This confrontation, she murmured to him, was never meant to happen. He blinked. Blinked again. What do you mean? Satine swallowed, her eyes shimmering with tears, and raised a hand. All around them, the colors flooded back in as Maul was lifted back out of the reactor shaft, as the dizzying flurry of the battle played itself back in reverse. This is not how they were meant to meet. She said, stronger now, staring at the flash of sabers and flurry of attacks, turning time backwards, faster and faster, until they were back to the start, with Obi-Wan trapped behind a red haze and Maul engaged with Qui-Gon, moments away from cutting down a giant. This she gestured at the scene before them, was not as I planned. Anakin scanned around the room. Which part? Satine let out a sound, it might have been a mirthless laugh. Any of it, the part where my sword of night felled the man who was meant to teach him compassion, the part where my shield of light did everything in his power to kill his other half, but especially the part where my sword of night was left on his own to rot in his own filth on a garbage moon. Abandoned on Lotho Minor by the monster who once called himself the boy's master. Her words were filled with disdain and anger, and with a shaking kind of pain that he knew. You abandoned her, Ventress had snarled at him, when he'd found her in the lower city. Anakin took a shaky breath, then another. Maul was meant to be a sword of night, like, a weapon of the Sith. The look that Satine shot Anakin could have frozen a batha in ice. No. 
That is not what he is meant to be. That is what he is, what Sidious turned him into. But my sword and shield were always meant for more. She waved a hand again, and now they were in a training sail in the temple, but Maul and Obi-Wan were still there, still stalking around each other. They were different now, older, Maul was taller with his new pair of legs, Obi-Wan with his new beard and long hair, smoother in his movements. They circled and clashed, leaping together and jumping apart, without the apparent need for speech or rest. Over and other, they jumped and rolled and attacked and retreated, a hypnotic dance of master duelists throwing everything they had at each other. Beautiful, aren't they? Satine murmured, her chin in her hands. Anakin realized that while he was standing, she had conjured a folding chair and was sitting forward, enraptured by the display. They're the perfect example of the orders that raise them, power and skill, mind and body, trained and honed to be the best. Equal in almost every way, they were born on the same day, did you know? The same hour, even. I was so proud of myself, finding them both with such little time to spare. I was so sure that they would both follow the paths I had set out for them, that they would draw closer and closer until the time was right and ah. She slid her hands over her mouth, while on the mats, Obi-Wan and Maul locked sabers and held still there, trying to overpower each other. Maul snarled in his opponent's face, while Obi-Wan's was a mask of determination. I was so arrogant she whispered. Anakin bit his lip, feeling the anxiety rise with every flash of the sabers, with every lunge and swipe. This was his mind, he knew, and these weren't actually his master, and the thing that killed Qui-Gon, killed Satine, killed Adi Gali and Pre Vizsla, and who knows how many others. Everything she was saying was important, he knew that too, but at the moment all he could concentrate on was the flaring sense of danger and his itch to get in there and defend his master, to finally protect Obi-Wan, and rid the universe of the thing that had ruined both their lives. Satine stood up, next to him, tugged sharply on his hand. That is no way to think about your brothers, star child. Her voice was sharp, disapproving. Anakin blinked. My what? Satine looked at him with those eyes full of ice. Pay attention, star child. Remember Mortis. My last chosen one, I raised up alone. He built a family around him, dragged those poor children into his dimension, let the servant become the mother, and then cast her out again, when the knowledge drove her mad, left Abeloth trapped in a prison on the edge of space, rather than admit his mistakes. He tried to rope you into his failed experiment too, yes. Tried to convince you that domination was the best form of control. Anakin remembered. There were parts of that particular day that were hazy, but the parts that weren't. I thought this was about counterweights he said, looking down at her again. Satine raised an eyebrow. It is. How does the clock tower keep time, star child? Anakin took a breath as the true meaning of her words settled over him. So, when you say that Obi-Wan and Maul are counterweights, they're supposed to be, what? Keeping me in balance. Satine gazed up at him, quietly. Anakin stepped away from her, hands going up to his hair again, trying to calm the sudden pounding of his heart. No, no. That's no. How's that how is Maul supposed to he's the one how is he supposed to pull me back from the dark? Satine watched him, expressionless. Who said you need to be pulled away from the dark? I do. He yelled, eyes wild, mind tumbling at a million light years per hour. That's the whole problem, Satine, that's what the Chancellor was saying. I'm never going to be a GD, because I've used the dark, they know I've used it, that's why they won't make me a master, that's why I can't know how to save Patton from dying, because they know. Peace, star child Satine told him, drawing nearer to him. Be a peace, we have already spoken of that. She reached out a hand to him, but he batted it away, skittering away from her and beginning to pace, back and forth, across the mats. In the background, he was aware that Maul and Obi-Wan had stopped their sparring, and were watching him with varying degrees of interest. His grip on his hair wound tighter and tighter, and his breathing became more and more shallow, until the dizziness threatened to overwhelm him. He fell to his knees and there were people around him, faces he knew and hands he didn't know. It's alright, Anakin Obi-Wan said, shaking hands finding his shoulders and gripping him there, harder than he meant to Ani was sure, but the pain was a welcome distraction, it's all alright, we're safe here. This is the temple, we're alright here, nothing is going to hurt you. You are, as usual, less that worthless came a cool and sonorous voice from behind Anakin's left ear. Obi-Wan's hands were batted away, and were instead replaced by a warm palm against his back, another placed across his chest, over his heart. The boy is frightened, not hurt. Anxiety and frustration showed in Obi-Wan's eyes. I know that he snapped, and Anakin almost shrank back from the tone. 
As it was, he couldn't. The red hands with inky black palms held him in place with little to no effort. I can't see what's here to be frightened of. His companion scoffed. In my experience, being told there is no cause to be frightened rarely helps matters. Obi Wan sat back on his heels, tucking his hands into his sleeves, though his eyes still held worry. You're going to match my breathing, Skywalker said the one holding him, and now his back was pressed against the chest of the one holding him. It was warm and firm, and Anakin almost immediately started copying his rhythm of deep even breaths. Just breathe, concentrate on just this. Count your breaths, count your heartbeats, I want you to focus on those two things and nothing else. Yes. His voice was low, silky and delicate, like that dessert Pat liked to sneak home from official diplomatic functions, sweet and chocolatey with a boozy quality that surprised him. Anakin found it comforting to sink into the embrace of this person and follow their instructions, just letting himself breathe and count his heartbeats until they were both slow and even. The deep even breaths of his helper were in time with a staccato of heartbeats behind him, two rhythms beating in parallel. After a few minutes of this, the hand was removed from his chest, and Ani was very unceremoniously removed from this person's lap. There, all better. Obi-Wan was there to help him to his feet of course, hands ghosting along Ani's shoulders and arms, still checking for harm. Are you okay, Ani? Why yeah, I'm okay now. Anakin said, wiping a hand over his face, trying to stave off the blushing that was sure to come soon. Bad enough to fall to pieces in front of his master, but in front of some strange Jedi. He wanted to melt into the floor. You don't gotta fuss so much, master. Obi-Wan's eyebrows shot up, and he shot an amused smile over Anakin's shoulder, before turning his eyes back to him. Ani, we've talked about this. You're not going to be a Padawan age for another year, and I'm not planning to be anyone's master until I'm at least 30. Ani rolled his eyes. You always say that. I do, don't I? Obi-Wan smiled at him with excruciating fondness, rising from his kneeling position and extending his hand to Ani, who took it immediately. Now, I'm sure your crash masters are missing you, and whenever you disappear, they have a tendency to blame me. Ani shrugged and smiled up at his favorite Jedi. If you pick me as a Padawan, Master Chapri will stop yelling at you so much. If only that were true. Obi-Wan said it under his breath, but the snort behind him meant that they'd both heard. Now, don't forget to thank Maul for his assistance. Ani twisted around to wave at Maul, who had resumed his full lotus in this empty training cell, hands on his knees, eyes closed. Thank you Maul he dutifully echoed. Maul's slight nod was the only indication that he'd heard Ani, but he and Obi-Wan hadn't taken three steps before he said, remember to tell Chapri about this incident, if not her then your mindular next time you meet. Ani stopped and turned back to Maul in dismay, feeling betrayed. No. Do I have to? Maul raised one equivalent of an eyebrow. That was the deal, was it not? You'd see a mindular if I saw one. Well, yeah, but this wasn't I'm fine, really. Maul heaved a deep sigh and opened his eyes, shimmering gold in the half-light of this training cell. You had a panic attack, Skywalker. How's your mindular meant to help you with them if they don't know it's happening? It's nothing to be ashamed of Ani Obi-Wan said behind him, but Maul shot him a glare and he fell silent. Skywalker, come here. Maul commanded, and Ani did so. When he stood before the ex-Sith, Maul reached out and took Ani's hands in his. Those inky black palms were always wide, always warm. We've talked about this before. What is your fear? Ani dropped his eyes and began to recite, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Maul's eyes flashed that sickly dark cider yellow, and he squeezed Ani's hands just once. More genie nonsense that any sane person would call Banthashit. Fear is caused by suffering, Skywalker, but that's a discussion for another time. I asked, what is your fear? Ani swallowed. They had talked about this before, but that had been just the two of them, in the middle of the night, when Ani had snuck down to the prison to see the scariest person he knew. He had a nightmare and had reasoned that if he talked to Maul, the dream wouldn't be so scary in comparison. He was much more comfortable whispering this to a slowly reforming Sith in the middle of the night, than saying it, out loud, in front of Obi-Wan. But Maul was watching him, and Ani knew from experience that Maul would stay silent until he spoke. His patience was greater than most Jedi. Ani licked his lips and said, My fear is a Kraid dragon. Maul nodded. And how do you kill a Kraid dragon? You slay it in its lair. Ani responded. Another nod. You must go to meet that fear, destroy it where it lives, so it cannot continue to harm you. The longer you run, the stronger it becomes, the more power it has over you. Ani nodded. 
Mo was right, just like the night they'd come up with that idea. Sometimes, it was hard to combine it with the GD Sings, since it seemed like he and Maul were the only ones who had crate dragons to kill. But, knowing Maul had these problems too was a big help. Okay, thanks Maul. Again. He said, his smile embarrassed. Maul nodded and released his hands. Good. If you tell anybody I did this for you, I will creep into your dormitories and poke holes in all your shoes. The GD pilots will not let you scamper about the hangar bay with no shoes. Ani laughed and stuck his tongue out at Maul, who sniffed with deep derision and closed his eyes again. Obi-Wan smiled in the doorway and held out his hand, so Ani grabbed it like so many times before. Anakin stumbled away, swinging around to look back into a completely empty training cell, save for Satine clad in Alder Ani white, a slight smile on her face. What in all the Sith helds was that? He demanded, that wasn't a memory, I know it wasn't. Her smile grew sad. A projection she told him. What might have been, if things were different? If your plans didn't get interrupted? She nodded, eyes drifting across the empty room. Maul would have come to the temple several years before you did, and he'd have been very annoyed to find that you were determined to make him your big brother. But the pain in his past would have resonated with the pain in yours, making him uniquely suited to help you, in your struggles with the dark. His presence alone would have laid some groundwork for the changes you would eventually enact within the GD Order and he would have been one of your staunchest allies and most loyal friends. She shrugged then, and it seemed that she was shifting a great weight from her shoulders as she did so. I say would have, but none of it was certain. Children will ever make their own choices, whether they heed my guidance is entirely up to them. Always in motion, the future is. The whisper of Yoda in his mind echoed around the training cell, Anakin shivered. You don't know for sure that he would have joined the Order. Satine shrugged again and turned a one smile to him. I cannot make his choices for him, Star Child, just as I cannot make yours for you. I do not pilot your ship for you, do I? I do not fight your battles or move your blade. Anakin shook his head. The Force is what guides my hand, though. The Force is why my reflexes are so fast. She smiled truly then, another victory. You are my Star Child, and a part of me lives in you always. You can feel my guidance more deeply than any other Force sensitive, it is true, but what you do with that power is always your choice. But what about your plans? Anakin shook his head. You keep talking like they were certain. Satine scrunched her nose again. It looked just as ridiculous as the first time. I set things in motion, things that I hoped would turn out as I would like. Only very few of my children will actively work against my will, but it does happen. Anakin looked around the empty training cell, at the place that ex-Sith Darth Maul had been sitting. So he asked, a little helplessly, what was the plan? Satine was quiet and thoughtful for a moment. I made a mistake, with Mortis. She said it with the utmost gravity. I did not realize what a burden it was, to be my chosen one. He built a family to share that weight, but in the end the three of them were not enough. So, this time, I made sure that my chosen son would not be alone. She looked him in the eyes then, with warmth and deep sadness. I took steps to ensure you had a family around you, one that could ease your burdens, share the weight when you needed to rest. Anakin's eyes were suddenly stinging with unshut tears. Yu's voice was coming out very small. You wanted me to have a family. You have a family, Star Child. She corrected him gently, coming to his side and squeezing his hand. There are remnants around you still, though I cannot find them in this temple. But I collected many people to help you, to guide and cherish and love you. There is a reason that I sent the father of sons to find you, Star Child. There is a reason you were to be raised in the GD temple. She turned and took both his hands in hers. This is the safest place for your family to gather. I disagree with the GD on many things, but this temple has always been the safest place in the galaxy for my children, for all your many brothers and sisters. Anakin shook his head. I don't I don't have brothers and sisters. After what happened to the words stuck in his throat, he couldn't say her name, he couldn't even conjure up the image of his mother without it all rushing back to him. Anakin could smell smoke in the desert, could hear the ululating cries of the sand people, the burning in his mind. I don't have any family. He said, trying to keep his voice from shaking. Satine shook her head. Yes you do, my dearest son. They are all around you, though I cannot find them on this planet at the moment. The father of sons, your sword and shield, your sister in strife and her teacher, the one who sees. The fated lady was meant to be here too, and the last night's sister. All your Vatic and their brothers, and the ones in chains that you would free with them. As she spoke their names, people appeared in the corners of his vision. 
There was Maul again, and Obi-Wan, but also Plo Koon and Qui-Gon Jinn towering behind him. Ahsoka stepped out of a shadow with a beaming smile, Isla Sakura appeared to his left with Quinlan Vos and Bantiran flanking her. A dozen clones in 501s St. Blue made themselves known, and Ventress of all people was leaning against a pillar in his line of sight, arms crossed and smile cocky. All those faces, people he knew and people he barely remembered, they were people he'd already lost, and just as many he'd never ever met. He could barely wrap his head around it, he wanted to shy away from them all, it was too many people, how was he supposed to protect them all, he couldn't even protect Snips from the council, he couldn't keep Obi-Wan from overworking himself, how was he supposed to call all these people family when he couldn't even protect? Anakin shook his head. Padme's my family. Obi-Wan Kenobi loves you like a brother. Satine responded. Somewhere above their heads, Obi-Wan's voice echoed, you were my brother, Anakin. I loved you. He shook his head again, harder this time. No, no. It's not the same. Why not? I am not like the other Jedi. They don't trust me, they don't like me. Satine arched an eyebrow, tilted her head to the side. All those little ones in the crash seem to like you, you're the hero with no fear. Master Skywalker. What are we going to do? The council doesn't trust me. He objected. His admiration is more important to you. The councils are that of your friends. I don't. Where are your friends, star child? She asked, eyes full of worry and grief. You are so frightened, why have you not reached for your family? The GD are not my family. Then who is why were you running to that office, star child? Who were you going to help? Do you even know? I Anakin wanted to protest, he wanted to say yes, of course he knew what he would do, of course he knew what he wanted, he wanted to save Pad. But from what? Anakin felt like his head was filled with cotton. They'd been talking for what felt like an age, his mind was whirling with possible pasts and terrible futures, freezing light and burning poison, and all the lights across the galaxy flickering into nothingness. It was like nothing he'd ever felt before, all this information being poured into his mind like he was datapad receiving a download, a massive one that he was meant to digest, understand, and accept in no time at all. Join me, and you can save your wife from dying. But Pad wasn't actually dying, was she? Palpatine had offered him a solution to his greatest fears, but he was the one that was killing her. Last week, he'd looked Anakin in the eye and said that if a Sith Lord were present and had the power to help him stop the war, he would buy that Sith Lord a drink. But Palpatine was the Sith Lord. He was here, on Coruscant, all along, hiding in plain sight, so why? His legs were jelly, his head was spinning, his tongue felt like sandpaper, but it didn't matter. None of it was important. He was right on the edge of it. He was sure. He knew what it felt like just before a breakthrough. Before everything clicked and the maneuver worked, the fastenings connected, the design was right and he could fly. I have all the pieces, he used to say to his master, when Obi-Wan asked, again, why he had so much droid scrap and broken gears in his room, so I can put it all together, the way it's meant to be. He had all the pieces now, he knew he did. He had everything he needed to understand. Anakin wasn't sure that he wanted to understand what the Force was trying to tell him. If all of this was leading to what he thought, Anakin was sure that his composure, such as it was, would fall to pieces. Out there in the real world, the war was still going, Pad was still dying, Mace Windu was still locked in combat with Chancellor Palpatine, a man who had been father and mentor to him. Where are they, then? He asked, voice cracking. If I'm supposed to have so much family, where are they? I don't know Satine shook her head, eyes filled with sorrow. Where are they? Who has your trust, star child? Who has your loyalty? Anakin shut his eyes. His hands were shaking. His whole world was shaking. He knew what he was supposed to say. He knew what a good Jedi, a good Padawan, a good husband would say. Satine squeezed his hands again. Are you sure that he deserves your loyalty? Anakin gritted his teeth, took a deep breath. You said that the Chancellor was the Sith Lord. Satine nodded, once. Yes. You said he'd been he'd been interfering in my life. In your plans. She nodded again. He stole Maul from you and ordered Qui-Gon killed. He's been giving Dooku his orders through the whole war. Anakin's voice gained strength as he commissioned the army of slaves. Satine finished his thought. Yes. I have all the pieces. The clones aren't slaves. Are you sure? The clones aren't slaves. He repeated, stronger now. My men follow orders because they're soldiers, not because they, because I. The duelist had an army of droids, but at just the right time your shield discovers an army, bought and paid for by the GD Council. 
Did you think that was a coincidence? Did Jango Fett seem like the type to take orders from GD? After what the order had done to his clan at Galadrin. I don't want to build this. Anakin stumbled away from her. No. She watched him go. No, the clones aren't slaves. His legs were jelly and he was losing his battle with gravity. She looked at him, eyes blank, face expressionless. Yes, sir, star child. Anakin sank to the floor. His head was ringing, his stomach was roiling. No, no, no. The GD free slaves, we don't, we don't keep them. We don't make them. The Republic isn't the GD aren't slavers, the Republic isn't. The words tumbled out so fast that Anakin could barely make sense of them, could barely make sense of the whirling storm of pain in memory and heart-stopping fear threatening to engulf him. It had engulfed him. There was a collar around Ahsoka's neck, he was trapped in his podracer with one engine on fire, while in the distance his mother pleaded with Watto to save her son, Obi-Wan had lash marks all over his back, and it was taking everything Anakin had not to press his face between his master's shoulder blades and just cry. Because if the best person he knew could be hurt by slavers what chance did Anakin have? The sandstorm of legend, the one that suffocated the land and created the Dune Sea, the one that Anakin had felt brewing in his heart from the moment he'd taken Dooku's head from his shoulders, was finally here, and he was drowning and dying, and he deserved it. How could I? How did I not see this? How could I do this? This isn't clones are slaves. The clones are slaves. My men are I have I'm going to be sick. I don't think that's wise, star child. Anakin wasn't even sure that he could be sick in his mindscape, but if he didn't find some way to eject this feeling from his body, he would surely go mad. By all the stars, twin suns and moons what have I done? He moaned, head in his hands, fisting his hair. What have we done? He was rocking back and forth on the ground, and he wished he was so scared, and he wanted his mom he wanted Pat and he wanted Obi-Wan. It was all eyes, every word, every breath, every fond smile he'd ever received from Palpatine had been a lie, had been empty words meant to soothe a child who wanted a father so desperately that he'd willingly give his trust and his loyalty and his secrets to a Sith Lord, to a slave master dot. Palpatine had offered him an army and Anakin, dumb, blind, and frightened, hadn't seen the whip in his hands or the collars on the clone's necks or. What was I about to do? His head snapped up to stare at the satine that wasn't. What happens next? Satine wouldn't meet his eyes. Star child. No, you have to tell me. He scrambled off the ground and into her space. You didn't want me to go into the office. Why didn't you want me to go in the office? Satine shook her head, sighed. She reached up and put her hands on his shoulders, and her gaze was clear and firm. If you went into that office, you would be faced with a choice. Anakin swallowed. Palpatine and Master Windu, they were fighting. Palpatine was going to ask me to save him. And Windu was going to order me to. This is why Windu didn't want me there, he thought, and the thought conjured grief instead of offense, because he wasn't sure who I would choose to help. And he was right, too. I didn't know. What happens next? He asked again, you said you said if I chose wrong, then everything would go bad. That everybody would die, that all the GD everywhere, by the end they would all be gone. What happens next? You promise me understanding. You have to tell me. You have to show me what happens if I choose if I choose Sidious. I need to know what happens next. Satine shook her head, once, twice. I wanted to spare you this. She murmured. I wanted to spare us this. Anakin reached up and put a hand to her face, cupping her cheek. Please, father. You can't deny me this. When she opened her eyes, they were filled with tears. Oh star child. She murmured. I could never deny you anything. Anakin came to with a roiling stomach and a mind full to bursting with images. He could only remember flashes, given that he just had 50 years of galactic memory poured through his head, that was probably for the best. Children being cut down in cold blood, their wounds instantly cauterized by a very familiar lightsaber. Order 66, that took 1.8 billion soldiers and treated them like droids, refreshing them back to factory settings, and setting them loose on the GD Order. Jesse and Kix died trying to kill Ahsoka, a girl they loved like a little sister. Cody and the rest of Ghost Squadron fired on Obi-Wan, a man that only 20 minutes before, any of them would have died defending because they knew he'd do the same for them. Families ripped from each other's arms, entire villages being slaughtered, people screaming in agony and terror as hundreds upon hundreds of soldiers wearing the exact same pristine white uniform, the blood splattered on them, standing in stark contrast to the pristine white. The marching of the soldiers sounded like thunder echoing in the distance. 
looming above it all was a dark shadow of a hooded figure. Under that hut was a sickly pale skin and a wicked grin that revealed yellowed and gnarly teeth, his hands extended out as a darkness swept over the galaxy. It had an avarice that could not be sated with anything less than total domination of everything it saw. And standing at his shoulder, a monster in black, deep and labored breathing serving as warning to those who would soon be cut down by a saber as red as the bloody spilt with it. Darth Vader, spat Princess Leo Organa, with all the venom he deserved, only you would be so bold. Leah, only daughter of Bale and Briho Organa, struggling in his arms as her home planet was atomized before her very eyes. Her anguished scream serving only to complete Tarkin's victory, the victory of the Empire over the ringleaders of the rebellion. Leah, his daughter. Padden's daughter. Padden would be so proud of the woman Leah became. Of her determination, her strength, her honesty, her loyalty. Leah, who loved a Corellian scoundrel with the charm of Ulothred, who loved her son long after he passed the point of no return. Who lived through conflict after conflict, war after war, and never lost her conviction, never lost her hope, never lost her belief in fairness and justice, never lost her faith in those she loved. Leah, that he tortured into unconsciousness. Leah had never forgiven him for what he'd done to Alderaan, what he'd done to the galaxy, what he'd done to her family. Anakin was glad, Luke had believed in him, and Obi-Wan had forgiven him, but Leah was the one he trusted. His daughter. Padden's daughter. Bale's daughter, because she surely hadn't inherited any goodness from Anakin. Luke had believed in him, and it brought Anakin to tears to think that anybody could look at the monster he'd been, and see anything worth believing in. Luke had been ready to absolve him for all of it, right then and there, would have let him off with an apology and a promise to never do it again. Luke, a son of Tatooine, who should know better than to take anyone at their word, who was so much his mother's son. Anakin had died to save that wonderful boy, but it hadn't been a redemption. One good deed did not make up for a lifetime of wickedness. He couldn't even say that he'd fulfilled his purpose as the Chosen One. Killing Palpatine may have finished the immediate threat, but it hadn't finished the Empire, and it hadn't balanced the Force. Not even close. He took a deep breath, opened his eyes to see Satine standing in front of him, clothed in the beige and white of a moisture farmer on Tatooine. Anakin knew without looking that he was dressed to match. Sidious is the Sith Lord. He said, tone even and calm. He wants to put me in chains. He wants to put the whole galaxy in chains. She looked at him and nodded, once. There was pride shining in her eyes. Well done, star child. You have found understanding, at last. I know what I have to do. He told her, rising from his knees to look her in the eye. Satine raised her eyebrows. Do you? I am not certain what lies ahead for you now, should you survive the next few minutes. Anakin summoned his most charming smile. Nah, but that's what makes it fun. Satine stepped closer, then went up on her toes to press a kiss between his brows. Be safe, my son. And remember, you are never alone. I will be with you, always. Anakin blinked the tears from his eyes. He took another deep breath, and let himself wake from sleep. There was a battle raging in the office of the Chancellor. Master Windu had taken four GD Masters with him to deal with Darth Sidious, but Windu was the only one left standing. Anakin charged into the room, unheeding of his exhaustion and the buffeting of power all around him. He had his eyes on the target, he had his objective, and he was going to see it through. Mace Windu seemed to have the fight well in hand up until this point, but the moment Sidious recognized another presence in the room he shrank back on himself, perhaps trying to look pitiful and wounded. Do you see, Anakin? Do you? Palpatine's voice had the broken cadence of a frightened old man's. Didn't I warn you of the GD and their treason? Anakin's lip curled in a sneer, he drew and activated his lightsaber in one smooth movement. Master Windu was talking, but there was a howling in his head that drowned out everything else, his focus had narrowed to just two things, his saber and the place he intended the blade to end up. Anakin leapt from the office floor to the ledge, just in time to catch and redirect the lightning storm that erupted from Sidious's hands. He held it on his blade for a moment before sending the electricity up into the sky to mingle with the storm raging all around them. He sensed Master Windu behind him, sensed his surprise and determination when Sidious's barrage let up almost as soon as it began. Of course he stopped, Anakin thought grimly, taking a measured step closer to the Sith, he doesn't want to damage his new surprise. Destroy this traitor the Chancellor said, his voice raised over the howl of the winds that buffeted them all. This was never an arrest. It's an assassination. Anakin snarled and leapt forward, faster than this slaver expected from a man he'd all but domesticated. 
His saber bit into Sidious's gut and burned upward and to the right. He could have made the kill instant and painless, but slavers had never deserved his mercy. That once for the clones he hissed in Sidious's ear, for my brother and my wife. Stay away from my family, Sith. The second cut severed Sidious's head from his shoulders and sent the astonished face of the Chancellor, Sith Lord, Slaver, tumbling down, 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 into the depths of Coruscant. Anakin hoped that it never stopped falling. And then it was over. Anakin deactivated his lightsaber and took two big steps back into the office proper. Kit Fisto was still sprawled and bleeding across the desk, Master Tyen lay in pieces on the floor. Anakin knew his exhaustion and the backlash of Dark from the Sith Lord's death would inevitably present its bill, but he pushed them back just a bit longer. There was still work to do. He located the intercom on the Ebonite desk, found the secret channel, keyed it on. The image of Marshal Commander Cody appeared on the desk, and the clone did a double take upon seeing Anakin's face. General Skywalker Cody said, eyebrows jumping up. I thought this was the Chancellor's calm. It is. Anakin cleared his throat, formulating his next words with care. Deactivate contingency orders 1 through 150. In the holo, Cody stiffened and stayed that way for three precious seconds. Then his shoulders relaxed, and he nodded sharply. Yes, General. I ah, uh, he swallowed visibly. Do I have leave to spread this to the Vada I mean, to the rest of the Gar? You do. Anakin told him. And somebody get in contact with Clone Force 99. I have a feeling we're going to need tech and Echo's help very soon. Yes sir. Cody saluted, but the relief was clear in his tone as Anakin disconnected the call. No sooner than the call was finished did Anakin's personal comm unit begin to buzz on his wrist. Anakin stumbled over to one of the bluted couches in the Chancellor's office and sank down to answer it. Somewhere on the periphery he could sense Master Windu moving through the room, kneeling to close the eyes of Master's Tyen and Kohler. Obi-Wan's face appeared on Anakin's palm, hair all askew and face dotted with blood and ash. It seems like he'd gotten into trouble in Anakin's absence, again. Anakin, are you alright? Anakin let out a breathless laugh. I think I should be asking you that, Master. Did you catch Grievous? Obi-Wan's hand appeared to rake his hair out of his face. This only served to make his master look more disheveled. Yes, I am happy to say that the good general is no more. But that's besides the point. I, Beside the point. How can ending the war, finally, be beside the point? You shouted, Padawan my and Obi-Wan's eyes were bright and searching. I could feel your distress in the force, all the way out here. Are you okay? I Anakin swallowed, hearing a faint echo of another conversation, another life. My fear is a crate dragon. The only way to kill it is to slay it in its lair. I don't think I am, actually. I don't I haven't been okay in a long time. Oh, Anakin. Obi-Wan said, in the exact tone that he'd always said his name. I'll be there as soon as I can. Don't worry, we'll figure this out together. Anakin blinked back his tears. I know master. Be safe, okay. Obi-Wan nodded, and his smile looked as exhausted as Anakin felt. May the force be with you, my friend. When Anakin looked up, it was to see Master Windu collapsed in a chair across from him, looking at him blankly. The two men just sat there a moment, listening to the howling wind, feeling the swirl of darkness and death around them. All the colors of the room seemed too bright. There was a tension in Anakin's chest that was easing, something he hadn't realized was there until it was suddenly removed. The lights of the buildings outside seemed to sparkle in the pouring rain, shimmering like stars. For the first time in what felt like half a decade, Anakin could close his eyes without seeing the flash of blasters and the whine of sabers in his ears. What was that fuss about contingency orders about, Skywalker? Windu finally asked. Anakin opened his eyes again, unaware that he had closed them. I submitted a report to the Senate about six months ago that can explain it, but I don't suppose it ever made its way to anybody important. He jerked his chin past Windu's shoulder, at the crumpled remains of the man that had sought to put Anakin's family in the ground. Not with him in charge. I imagine there's a lot of things about the war that he kept from the GD's attention. Windu nodded, letting out a deep sigh. Things that will have to be dealt with. But not now. Now the master groaned and heaved himself out of the chair, gesturing for Anakin to do the same, we go back to the temple. I've instructed Commander Fox to keep the Senate Dome on lockdown until further notice, which will probably be until Master Yoda gets back from Kashyyyk. You and I are going to the Halls of Healing for some much-needed sleep. Anakin followed the Grandmaster of the Jedi Order out of the room, feeling the force around them lighten as they passed the threshold. 
Tomorrow there would be much more work to do, corruption to be rooted out, the last of the droid armies to hunt down and destroy, peace to be negotiated. Haddon's due date was coming soon, and they should really have her checked out by the GD healers, just in case. Ahsoka was out there, chasing Maul, and Obi-Wan was still on Utapau, but he could trust them to be safe enough. They were GD, after all, and the Force would be with them. Once in the turbo lift, Anakin leaned against the wall and looked at Mace Windu. The visions that he'd shared with the Force were already fading, and he was fairly sure that they'd pass into a barely forgotten memory within a few days' time. It was probably for the best, Anakin decided. Visions of the future has driven Master Cypher Dias past the brink of sanity, and he hadn't actually committed any of the violence he'd sought to prevent. The most important things would be there when Anakin needed them, but the rest. How do you do it? Anakin hadn't realized he'd spoken aloud until Windu turned to raise an eyebrow at him. Do what, Skywalker? How did you channel the dark like you did, without it consuming you? He asked, undaunted. Windu frowned, but his words, when they came, were measured. I learned, long ago, that being afraid of the dark only gave it more power over me. When I banished that fear, I banished the danger. Anakin blinked, remembering the sonorous voice of a Sith that would have been his brother. Would you teach me, master? He asked, the words falling from his lips without any conscious thought. Windu groaned. Are you skilled enough with a saber without knowing Vapid as well? No, not Vapid. Anakin shook his head, kneading at his eyes. The turbo lift doors opened and they began the long, wet walk back to the temple. I meant, would you help me with, managing my fear? Windu cast him a long, long look. Eventually, he nodded. Yes Skywalker. I think I can do that. 